basically last afternoon of the year for senior design presentations. We're going to start with the first group in the afternoon. A group with, with a major, if not the, the largest, charisma of the whole <laughs> UT Tyler HEC. Uh, they have done tremendous things, tremendous achievement, not only academically, but outside the school. They have basically achieved multiple, multiple goals, uh, not only from the volunteer part of view, but also academically. I have to say that one of our proud teams uh, this year, 2018-2019, last year, they participated into a PSGC uh, design challenge, performing at a very high level within the first five positions. Now they're basically facing a more difficult challenge, which is going to be the next 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> With that introduction, first double eating of the afternoon. Are you guys ready? Good afternoon, y'all. I'm Benjamin Glass. I'm Andrew Luce. I'm Victoria Moore. I'm Abraham Garcia. And we are Team Body Language. So before we get started, I'd like to ask you guys a question. Whose phone is not on silent right now? And if a phone was to go off in this room, would you wonder for a minute if it was yours? In a crowded environment like this, it's easy to misunderstand or to mistake an audio signal. This is because human senses have a limited bandwidth. And if this bandwidth is exceeded, further incoming signals could be ignored or mistaken. NASA has this problem, both in space and on the ground. During an EVA, astronauts rely solely on audio communication to monitor incoming warning signals, navigate themselves, and communicate with the ship. Mission Control has a similarly crowded soundscape, but is a much more accessible test environment for a possible proof of concept solution. If we can develop a solution for mission control to help reduce the crowding and the audiovisual sensory channels, then we can justify to NASA to invest in upgrades to spacesuit technology. We think this solution is a tactile display. Imagine feeling some signals moving along your body instructing you to exit this room. We think that a tactile display can be a solution for this problem by using a combination of time varying signals, uh, changing the frequency to create patterns to communicate information to a user. Therefore, the tactile display can en enhance this uh, particular sensory channel and advance the entire bandwidth that can be used to communicate information to any user. So, to uh, enhance our system, we decided to seek out six different uh, ideas here. We chose simplicity to make it easy for any user to put it on, uh, adaptability so that it can fit multiple people, to have a uh, minimum uh, milliamp hour usage for extended battery life, to be wearable for long periods of time, to have a robust design for any mechanical stress, and to maintain accuracy in the wireless signals that are sent. Our first attempt at a tactile display, as Professor Garcia mentioned, was for NASA's Texas Space Grant Consortium Design Challenge. We were tasked with designing a system that would detect audio alarms, one of three, and trigger corresponding vibratory haptic feedback on a device mounted behind the ear. So this is what we designed here on the left. Um, on this slide, you can see some pictures of the prototypes we went through as we were designing this box. Um, on the top right, uh, there's a proto board that worked with limited amounts of success, and on the bottom right, our final prototype, which you see sitting here in front of you. So we designed this system to detect any of three different audio alarms, one short beep, one with two, one long beep, and one with three repeated long beeps, and respond with, as you can see in this timing diagram, uh, different vibratory patterns. And this is the earpiece that we designed. Um, it's modeled on hearing aids in an attempt to be as comfortable as possible. As you can see, for the TSGC design showcase, we fabricated a desktop module that would connect seamlessly to their already existing hardware, listen for the alarm tones, and then propagate them as a vibrational pattern on the earpiece. 
when we presented this last December, it went pretty well, but we knew there was a lot more that we could do with it, and we wanted to do that. We knew we could generalize the input to not just listen for alarms, but to be any kind of input, really. We knew that we wanted to make it more mobile and more comfortable to wear. We also knew that we could increase our uh, display resolution from just the single earpiece to more contact points. And if we could arrange these contact points three-dimensionally, then we could begin to explore a three-dimensional space of conveying spatial information. So with these goals in mind, we designed a new system. We, for portability, we added Bluetooth low energy connectivity and battery operation. Uh, the device no longer needs to listen for alarms, it just receives the commands over Bluetooth. Uh, to increase the, uh, to upgrade the uh, display from just a single earpiece, we added uh, 16 vibrational motors, which we implemented in the sleeve design, which you can see here, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, unfortunately, our previous system wasn't equipped to handle Bluetooth, nor was it equipped to handle the increased load of the 16 motors. So we had to uh, consider that when we're implementing our design. So we made a new board to interface with the microcontroller that would handle the Bluetooth connection, as well as to house the motor drivers that were necessary to provide sufficient current to power each of the 16 tactors. We used a couple of shift registers to implement SPI communications so that we could individually address and turn on or off each motor. Under the generous supervision of professional engineer Robert Moore, we routed the PCB and it was manufactured for us by Advanced Circuits in Colorado. We hand soldered the components and Weatherford Labs in Katy. Uh, with the help of a mechanical engineering student, Eduardo Garcia, we 3D printed a case out of PETG. Uh, this polymer has a very high uh, rating for chemical resistance and high impact resistance, which makes it perfectly suitable for electronics. The case has a push-on clip that holds the electronic components in place. It has a, a passive airflow to keep the electronics cool, and it, uh, it sits on a, a, a strap that rests on your arm comfortably. So we began our design uh, with uh, various iterations. First, we designed three straps around the arm we thought that the arm would be a comfortable place to implement uh, the tactile signals. Uh, the forearm is easy to model and it provides enough space to be intuitive to understand a three-dimensional signal array. Uh, the tactors or the motors are displaced at are an average of 30 millimeters around the upper section of the arm and as they get closer to the wrist they are strategically placed to uh, to be more comfortable for every user. We designed the sleeve with three fabrics, and as you can see, there are many people that fit it, from small people and larger people, but in the future, we would make that a more modular sleeve to fit much other, uh, larger variation of users. Our system is built around Dialog's 14683 microprocessor. You can see the development board we're using here. Um, it's an ARM Cortex-based microprocessor, and we chose it for two major reasons. First of all, it's got an integrated Bluetooth low-energy radio. So this allows us to save space on our PCB layout and also save power by not using more than one chip. Secondly, it's extremely energy efficient. Um, it uses less than 8 milliwatts even when the Bluetooth connection is active. So it allows us to extend our battery life to the maximum possible. So in this slide, you'll see a simplified diagram of how our MCU is working. Over the Bluetooth low energy connection, we send a three byte signal. The first two bytes, or 16 bits, contain signals that switch on or off each individual motor in the sleeve. And the last byte contains timing information, so the sleeve knows to automatically turn off the motors after a certain period of time in case you lose connection. Finally, we designed an app to go with this device in order to demonstrate how it works. So on the left there, you can see the connection manager. This page enables you to connect to the device and also test each individual motor to ensure that they're all working. On the second page, we have a custom pattern creator so that you can experiment with new forms of tactile language um, and find one that's custom for your use case. And on the third page, our navigation demo. Uh, 
one of our principal interests in developing this was exploring spatial communication. So when we were preparing to de uh, develop our navigation demo, we were considering basic gestures that we could convey, uh, simple ones, as you'll see, forward, backward, turn left, turn right, and just stop. Uh, when we were considering these patterns, we took a best guess at what would convey this intuitively. And we started with these wave-like propagations seen here. We experimented with the duration of each section of the wave and came upon three distinct timing patterns and then took that into our first phase of user testing, which consisted of just outputting the device on a volunteer and uh, figuring out which of the three patterns they found most intuitively conveyed to them the spatial gesture that we were trying to. Uh, the best of these gestures moved on to our second phase of user testing, which was a lot more fun. We got to blindfold volunteers and explain to them a brief tutorial of how the device works and uh, what they can expect. And then we attempted to navigate a uh, stool obstacle course. Um, we had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, <laughs> the principal take back from that, which we found very interesting, is the ability to distinguish between the signals varied very highly between people. That was unfortunate, but however, after a period of familiarizing themselves with the device, it started to become more intuitive and they started to have trouble discerning less and less. And we equated that to learning a new language. So you hear the language more, you understand it more, you feel it more, you understand it more. But did our device meet our original goals of success? We found that it met its simplicity by being very intuitive to, you know what it's doing when you put it on, you understand the concept, takes less than a minute to put on, less than a minute to take off. Um, it's adaptable in that it fits every single person we've tried putting it on. Uh, it's long lasting. The battery, we tested firing all the vibrational motors at once and calculated that at full capacity it would go for eight hours. So we equated that to, or we compared that to maybe a few days of normal usage. Um, it was quite comfortable. We questioned users with the shackle scale, which is an, a subjective determination between one being uh, the most comfortable and 11 being least comfortable. And we scored about an average of two, which is pretty comfortable. Uh, the device is robust in that it withstood falls and maintained operation from heights up to two meters. And um, it's also accurate, which was the most important. We didn't want to lose any signals during the entirety of both of our testing trials, we uh, found 100% successful signal propagation to the sleep, whether or not the user deciphered it. While we were evaluating our device, we considered the most likely and the most severe risks that could occur. The most severe risk is obviously a battery fire, which could be lethal, but as long as we avoid the maximum charging and discharging rates of a lithium ion battery, that's likely to be avoided. More possible is a dropped wireless connection, but as long as the user stays within our specified range, that's unlikely to happen, or a physical connection failure, so an impact harder than a drop from a two meter height. So that's why we included the diagnostic test pattern, so that after a collision or a fall, the user could check to ensure the device is still functional. The cost of the materials for our initial prototype was just shy of $200, and if we were to professionally assemble the electronics in the sleeve, it would be about double that. But if we were producing at scale by about 100 units, the total cost of materials and professional assembly would be less than $150. There's no exact comparable devices on the market, but the closest analog would be a one-dimensional navigational display for the blind, which starts at $250. Our team formed to help NASA find a way to increase the amount of information that a person can process. But along the way, we realized that tactile displays have a lot of potential for diverse applications, including navigational displays for the blind, safety devices for drilling platforms, or biofeedback for rehabilitation. In the future, we hope to integrate the electronics into a single board, shrink the mechanical assembly down to a forearm sleeve. So with that, we'd like to hit the fun part of this presentation. Dr. Robinson, would you come up here, please? Come on, give him a hand. Dr. Dr. Robinson here. We've been practicing with him a little bit since yesterday. So 
hook would go up. So he's experienced. <laughs> a little bit. He had like maybe half an hour with it. He has built some familiarity. Yeah. Dr. Robinson Bandages is involved. a good test subject because, for one, he's maybe a size large. And <laughs> for two, it might be more effective if these were actual electroshocks. <laughs> so we consider it a pretty fair test. <laughs> no, it's covered by the school. <laughs> As you've seen before, we've got this app navigational interface. Andrew's going to be giving him directions. If you would, we would like you to remain quiet for the duration of the test so he doesn't have any possibility of orienting himself by your voices. So, without further ado... He's very disoriented by the blind people as long as we stay quiet. Space Grant this semester. So we made our own metrics and 
we did meet those. Last semester, we were assigned a problem by Texas Space Grant, and it was to develop a proof of concept for mission control, the plug and play system. And so that was successful for their use, but we don't know if they're able to integrate that into mission control right now, so we wanted to move forward with something that we could test quickly. Okay. Yes, sir. It was a different output for him to step up instead of just move forward. How did you feel a different output? We only realized yesterday we needed the step signal, so <laughs> we repurposed the stop signal. If you pushed it twice, you knew to step. We knew we had a plan to prepare this demo. We were not aware of the stairs until okay. yesterday. So he knew. Yes, sir. Something that we were discussing approximately 30 minutes ago. So he was able to pick up on that pretty quickly. Absolutely. <laughs> like a buy your bros key, you know? some uh, voltage control circuitry on the development board, so we have to run it in the range that the microcontroller wants. If we were to implement that circuitry onto our new PCB, then we could accept five volts. But what is the range the microprocessor wants? So three to four. So this is a USB enabled device Yes, but we're not using the USB supply line to the microcontroller. The microcontroller would be powered by USB or by battery, but it's actually disabled. So we had to kind of jump into that connection to the microcontroller. It's disabled on this development board. Right, in a final PCB, uh, we would have access to all that stuff and we would be able to do it even better than we did on this one. So in theory, you're assuming it was on a five volt. Yes, yeah. that would make sense. Um, Any other questions? You said that the battery life was about eight hours at full capacity or full load. Yes. Would you kind of explain what that means, full load? So if half of the motors in the sleeve are firing continuously, absolutely no brakes whatsoever, so we're not even communicating information at this point, it's just running, it would last for more than eight hours. Uh, we measured the current draw and we know the capacity of the battery. So under any normal use condition, when you're not using you know, eight motors continuously, or you're you know, blinking them or whatever, we expect a good, at least two work days worth of usage. And what was your idle current? I think you mentioned that. It was less than three milliamps. It was surprisingly small. So the microcontroller board itself is designed to be low energy, mm -hmm. and then all the components on the PCB were chosen for their low quiescent currents as well. Any other questions? How would they make a difference in between going up and going down? Have you guys thought about it? Because he got up. Never go. It's truly arbitrary. Oh, we would. Well, in any particular application, we would discuss the needs of the client or whoever, and uh, whatever felt most intuitive to them. So we would discuss with Robinson what feels like a downward motion for you. 
or what could acceptably be discerned with the download motion. And that's what's nice about having the app and the ability to quickly make custom patterns. Since Dr. Robinson actually has different preferences than most of the people we've tested, so we were able to make patterns that worked a little bit better for him. When we initially tested, we had a language prepared, but then we ultimately asked him what felt intuitive to him, and then we implemented that into the language. So for stepping downward, we would ask him, what does this feel like to you? And then we would put those patterns into the, uh, into the program. So the only further we could take this project would be to integrate it on a single PCB, but then what we really need before that is testing and mission control. And even though it's more accessible than space, that's still kind of a long wait time, so we can't really move forward much with this right now. Any other questions? 